We've been inundated with battle requests featuring dividend-focused ETFs. On today's program, we've got another audience-requested contest. This time, it's a triple header between a trio of high-dividend ETFs from Invesco, State Street Global, and Wisdom Tree. If you like dividend income hitting your balance sheet, stick around. Welcome to ETF Battles. I'm Ron DeLegge. Delighted to have you watching our program. The ETF matchups we do on this show are audience generated. And if you've got a certain contest that you'd like to see, well, send us your ticker symbols in the comment section below or on our Twitter feed at ETF Guide. Also, check out the description section below with links to our program sponsor, Direction Investments. We've also got links to our judges, along with viewer resources and just a bevy of other wonderful stuff. Um, before I introduce our judges, uh, today's ETF battle was requested by one of my favorite viewers, Wheels Always Turning. What a great username. And speaking of wheels, the other day I bumped into a wonderful song by Bob Wills. He's the king of Western Swing. And the song is titled, I've Got a New Road Underneath My Wheels. What a great title. And by the way, it's a great song. I'll post that in the description section below so that you can enjoy it wherever you are, especially if you're on the road with the summer summer travels. Uh, Wheels, congratulations. We chose your ETF battle, which means that you get your choice of an ETF battle shirt or a coffee mug. Be sure to visit the description section below for details on how to claim your prize. Uh, Wheels wanted to see today's triple header dividend focused battle featuring ETFs from Vesco, State Street Global, and Wisdom Tree. So we got DHS versus SPHD versus SPYD. Now, all three are performing quite well thus far in 2022, despite the correction in broader stock market indexes. We're going to dig a little deeper into the performance in a second. Judging today's high stakes contest is Meb Faber with Cambria Investment Management and Mike Akins with ETF Action. Judges, welcome back. Great to see you guys. Great to be here, Ron. Good to see you, Meb. Great to be here, guys. So our four battle categories are cost, exposure strategy, performance, and yield. We've combined those two. And then we've got the mystery battle category where you, our judges, can pick that single factor or maybe multiple factors that you think is crucial to today's contest. Our judges can also nominate wildcard ETFs if they feel there's better choices elsewhere. We're going to see if we get some of those. I've got the scorekeeping chores. At the end of the show, we'll also do a declaration of the overall winner. Keep in mind, none of the battle outcomes are ever predetermined or known in advance by myself or any of our judges. So let's get things started with our first category, cost. Meb, give us your analysis. All three funds are reasonable costs, um, the highest being DHS at 0.38%, SPHD 0.3%, and then SPYD at, at 0.07%, darn near free. Um, it reminds me of like a discussion. I mean, and yes, there's a difference. 20 basis points sounds like a lot, but then you realize the average mutual fund uh, is still 1.25%. And so, you know, things that are below 50 bips to me already, like you're in the same universe. You're over here, the right galaxy versus, you know, over here. Um, but that's not the only cost of course. There's trading costs, you know, all three or the spreads on the ETFs are down around a basis point or two. Um, an additional point, which is harder to find information on, you actually have to go dig through the prospectus and it matters less in this sort of large cap US equity, but listeners, it's, it's meaningful in other areas, is do the fund companies do short lending on the underlying securities and return that lending to investors? In this category, it's probably only a couple of basis points. In other categories, it can be 10, 20, or even multiple percentage points. So a very real cost. Um, and then lastly, these are all ETFs, so they should be tax efficient, so it should be a wash. So on paper, SPYD, the cheapest, but in reality, in my mind, they're all pretty good. That's a strong start. Thank you, Meb. Mike, we shift to you. How do you see it in terms of cost? Yeah, I don't have a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't have a lot to add to uh, Meb's discussion there. I, the one thing I would note on the expense thing, when it comes to clipping a coupon, um, the expense ratio does matter a little bit more in in that aspect as when 40 act funds distribute income, they take out their expense ratio. So if you're really looking to clip the highest coupon, all three of these, which I'll get into later, have very similar underlying yield or the average weighted yield of the underlying securities. Um, but if you look at the trailing 12 month SPYD 
has paid out the most in distributions. And I would argue that's probably a simple aspect that they don't have to offset as much of the expense ratio in that distribution. So just a little nugget for those that are really looking to clip the highest coupon. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see SPYD pay out a little more each year because of that lower expense ratio. But as always, anybody that you know, listens to my analysis, I think the makeup of the product is far more important than 20 basis points difference. So something to keep in mind, but um, not an overall deciding factor. SQID is my winner though, because in pure numbers, it's the cheapest. Thank you, Mike. That takes us next to exposure strategy. Give us your take. Yeah, so this is a, a good matchup. I mean, I think, you know, what's great about dividends in general is um, it's the largest smart beta strategy or fa- uh, category out there. I mean, obviously it's because of the value context hasn't gotten as much attention over the last decade as maybe it, it used to, but what goes unnoticed or at least unreported is these funds just bring in money hand over fist. They, they have continued to garner um, flows and they've even picked up those flows this year as you would expect since they're starting to see their time in the sun again. But there are massive differences. I was just doing a quick look and we have 71 US large cap dividend strategies in our category. And you know there's a difference between 25% between the bottom and top performer Um, DHS is actually the second best performer out of everything. Um, But from an exposure standpoint, I like to look first and foremost at sectors. Um, And I think we'll get into performance and yield, but really the driving difference in performance this year, can you can look at almost any fund and say, what's my energy exposure? Um, In this case, DHS has the highest energy exposure of the three, but a very important thing to understand with with these products, these smart beta or factor strategies is a better word for them, um, is what do they do with respect to maintaining sector exposures? Do they care? How big of a skew is it from the broad-based benchmarks? Um, DHS right now has about 20% into energy. Um, I actually like that. Um, and I, I look at that as a positive right now in this market. Um, you can't find that in very many strategies. Um, and it will change. It's, if you go back in time, it hasn't always been that way. So the strategy will update. But I like when I think about the exposure right now, I like that, that energy. The other thing that really leads me to um, DHS is just the fundamentals. If they're all very cheap relative to the overall market. They all have you know, forward PEs significantly lower than the S&P 500. Um, but if you get into kind of more of the quality aspects of you know, margins, ROE, across the board, DHS um, underlying tend to jump out to me as um, something I would look at as value, but with a quality tilt. Whereas the you know, debt equity ratios, the coverage ratios of SPYD and SPHD are much higher. Um, so just in general, from an exposure perspective, not getting into this strategy itself, but just looking under the hood at the holdings. I like DHS. That's solid analysis. Thank you, Mike. Meb, you're up next. How do you see things in terms of exposure strategy? You know, the big question for me always when you're looking at uh, a fund or a strategy is like, what is the main muscle movement? And like Mike mentioned, to me, these are actually very similar funds because the decision is, do you plan on using dividends as a screening factor in the first place versus something like market cap weighting? So already, if you decide to say, hey, I'm going to use high dividends, it already puts you over here. OK, and so all three of these are going to be like kind of first cousins um, or even siblings, really. They're, they're pretty close. Um, but then it gets into sort of the minutia. So, for example, looking at SPHD has the least amount of holdings at 50 DHS, the most amount of holdings, I think at up around 300. Um, you look at the average market cap, DHS at the largest, the average uh, holding, I think is like 80 billion uh, SPHD down around 50. But those are all mega or large cap stocks, right? This, this is not a small cap or mid cap fund. Um, so already, every time you make one of these decisions, it puts you in a smaller and smaller universe. Um, and I like that. I mean, you, the whole point of being uh, active or tilting away from market cap weighting is that you are concentrated. Um, on paper, some of them do different things. So, you know, SPYD is not doing a lot more than dividend weighting. Uh, if you look at SPHD, uh, it has a low vol component, right? So it's taking the 75 highest yield and then the 50 lowest vol. So it adds a little low vol kicker. And then the biggest differentiator is DHS, which uses a uh, trinity of value, quality, and momentum. 
And I like that, right? Um, Because for me, dividend at its core is giving you a value tilt. It's not explicitly targeting value, um, but it's giving you sort of a, a way of doing value. And so back in 99, you know, dividend, high dividend yielders on average traded about a 20% discount in the S&P. 99 got to the biggest discount ever at 50%. And then here we are again, where um, looking at value versus market cap weight and certainly growth, we've seen this over the past year, uh, has been a huge spread. And you've had this tailwind of value for prior 10 years is a huge headwind, right? So any three of these, you're going to have a slight value tilt, which is great. So all three are better, as, as Mike mentioned. You can do an x-ray. Uh, go to any website, you know, something and type in the ticker symbols and it'll give you an x-ray of the underlying holdings. So across any valuation metric, they all look similar. So it's odd because even the, even though the DHS explicitly targets value, the underlying holdings are actually pretty similar to the other two funds. But all three are better than, say, the S&P or market cap weight. So um, the good news. So I, I think they're all you'll, you'll do if you're targeting high dividend yield, you'll do just fine in all three. If I have to choose. Uh, I picked DHS for the explicit uh, value targeting. Excellent. Thank you, Meb. And if you want to use a screener, go to ETFaction.com. Uh, Mike and his firm does an excellent job in providing that sort of research. That takes us next to performance in yield. We've combined these two. You can't talk about dividends without talking about yield. So, Meb, you're still up. Give us your analysis on performance and yield. Which of these ETFs uh, stands out? I mean, the performance is pretty similar. You can kind of see how, uh, you know, they go, they perform versus the S&P a year like this year. Their values tilt, so they're going to do better. Um, what's interesting, though, is because the entire broad U.S. market got, in our opinion, so expensive over the past year or two, um, dividend yield was near an all-time low. I think the lowest record we ever set was around 1% on the S&P. And so it's funny to talk about high yield and only be talking about 3%, maybe 4% yields, right? Which is where we are. You end up in some of these foreign uh, uh, markets or, or U.S. historical, and you're talking about high yield. You're not talking about 3%. You're talking about 7 8 10%, right? Um, which has happened in the past. And so they're all kind of roughly in the same ballpark as yield, all roughly in the same ballpark as performance. Um, I give it kind of a wash for me on all three of those. So I, I don't have a a preferred fund in far as the uh, performance and yield category. Mike, how do you see it in terms of performance and yield? Do you agree with Meb's analysis? I agree on on the performance side. I, I think, generally speaking, I think of dividends as being a long-term buy and hold. Um, there's investors that are looking for um, that type of exposure and you find the strategy that best fits your methodology or your belief in the market system and, and you ride it. Um, and I think if you look out three, five, 10 years, these three funds are going to have um, not very material difference in returns. Um, there will be short-term dislocations, for example, DHS, um, with that value tilt, as Med um, astutely pointed out in the last um, segment, um, is is you know crushing it on the one year relative to these other two, crushing it year to date. Um, and a big part of that is that value component and also that overexposure to energy, which has um, up until recently been a big part of value too. Um, so just kind of taking it into the yield concept um all three of these have great underlying weighted yields i mean you're looking at anywhere from 3.4 to 3.75 um, weighted average yield of the underlying for these three strategies um so from that perspective relative to the s p you're picking up 200 basis points over 100 percent um, increase in yield relative to the s p um, but you know how they're getting that yield is different um you know for example dhs and sdyd have payout ratios around 50%, whereas SPHD is 70%. Um, that's getting pretty high. Now, if you take that in context, it's because it's getting a lot of utilities and that's that low volatility screen. Low volatility is always gonna get you towards um, the utility type companies. So I, I like DHS and SPYD from a yield, if I was gonna judge this from a yield perspective, I like their yields better. Um, I think a lot of the yield for SPH D is, is a utility driven yield, um, you know, more of a clip a coupon, which can be a good thing. Um, but at the end of the day, I keep coming back to the, the quality of the companies. Um, and I think the quality of the yield for DHS um, jumps out at me as better than that of SQID and SPHD. And that's right now. I'm not talking about, you know, you asked me this six months from now, that can change. Though I would think with their screening methodologies, uh, DHS will always have a little more quality tilt, 
and I like that. So DHS is my winner. Um, and as I try to play that back in my head, I hope it made sense. It did. Thank you very much, Mike. We next shift to the mystery battle category. This is one of my favorite uh, categories because it's a surprise. And this is where judges can pick that single factor or multiple factor to make their argument. So, Mike, what is your mystery battle category and who wins it? Yeah, I think I'm going to go with a quote here from The Office um, when Michael Scott said, how the turns have tabled. Um, and I really think that's mm-hmm. really where we're at right now in the market. Um, people that have been patient and held on to their dividend strategies, their value strategies, or at least offset some of their more high momentum strategies are getting rewarded. Um, and I think, um, you know, it, it makes me think of patience and really investing really is all about patience. And I think dividend investing has withstood um, the test of time. And so from that perspective, I like all three of these strategies. I think you, they're excellent allocations within a portfolio. Um, but I think the bigger takeaway for this battle to me is it's nice to be talking about dividends again. Um, it's, it seems like it's been too long and just to be able to talk dividends and value and um, long-term holding strategies, all three of those fit this, in that category for me. And um, so I'll just stick with uh, how the turns have tabled. Thank you very much, Mike. Meb, you're up. What is your mystery battle category and who wins it? Oh, boy. Okay. So we've waited this long for me to finally talk about the elephant in the room and that I think dividend investing strategies are totally nonsensical. Now, let me expand on that. I I wouldn't go as far as people on Twitter who said Meb hates dividends, (laughs) but... um, this goes back to when we first launched, started launching funds over eight years ago. Um, we wrote a book called Shareholder Yield. But let me be clear, dividend investing is fine. It's, it's totally fine. There are worse ways to invest. For example, you could invest in companies that are extremely expensive, in which case over the last year, you've lost 80% of your money, right? Uh, there's, there's other ideas that are worse. So dividend is fine and, and you will probably do okay. However, being a student of markets in history, you have to always assess, say, look, has something changed? Is there a structural change? Is there a change in the world? And usually there's not, uh, but, but sometimes there is. And so if you look at the history of how companies use cash, there's only five things they can do with cash. Um, and two of them, the way they distribute cash to shareholders is through cash dividends, but also through share buybacks. And share buybacks, historically, it's been going on for a century but they really started to pick up in the 1980s because of structural change um, where some laws got passed and said, hey, look, companies, we think there's gonna be a little more safe harbor to buy back shares. So companies started buying back shares because stock buybacks are a much more uh, tax efficient way to distribute cash to shareholders. Um, And so now buybacks started increasing every year until the late 90s, companies pay out more in buybacks than they do in dividends. So ignoring that factor or variable to me is totally insane because not only are you ignoring the buyback part, you're ignoring the share issuance part. And this is critical because you could have a company that has a 4% dividend yield, but guess what? They're awarding all their executives 5% of shares each year and options issuance, and you actually have a negative yield. So combining these factors or ignoring them to me is a huge whiff. On top of that, by the way, we did a paper uh, and, I, and I'm blanking on the name of it because no one read it, but it basically it's talking <laughs> about, do you invest in dividends? Maybe you should do this instead. And we demonstrated, there's very little in the academic literature about this, but if you are a taxable investor, particularly a taxable investor like a state like mine or New York, and if you're high net worth, the last thing you want on the planet is a high dividend yield strategy, but everyone loves dividends. They get that check in the mail. They think about pina coladas on the beach, passive income. On an after-tax basis, we believe that a high dividend yield strategy will underperform the S&P 500, okay? So if you're going to do value, which is really what dividend is, it gives you kind of a weird value tilt, don't do dividends, do value. And so we actually demonstrated that you could invest in stocks that don't pay any dividends but have a value tilt and it'll actually do better than the dividend ones. So there's a whole rabbit hole of philosophical opposition to this strategy, but dividends have a great brand and they have a great narrative, just like Coke versus Pepsi, just like all these other marketing initiatives. And like Mike mentioned, 
there's a gazillion dollars in these funds and every fund company has a high dividend fund. However, my belief is that a shareholder yield strategy involving dividends and net buybacks and value is a superior idea. So uh, the mystery category, all three of these fail for me <laughs> because they're uh, not looking at the entire picture. Um, so I'm going to give them a, a bump kiss zero on uh, 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 product strategy design uh, with excluding buybacks. All right. Very good. I got you down as a no vote or split decision for with all three. Thank you very much, Meb, for that detailed explanation. Now we shift to the part of the show where our judges get to give us their overall battle winner. So, Meb, you're up. Give it to us. So, look, as mentioned, I think there's better choices out there. However, I come to this with the presupposition that you want a high dividend yield strategy and in, in large caps in the U.S. Again, worse ways to do it. I'm fine with all three. However, if you force me to choose, I take DHS because particularly right now, I think that having a value tilt uh, and, and even adding quality and momentum will give you an edge versus a market that is currently broadly expensive and in a downtrend. So I love value always. I love value particularly over the last year or two even more. So my final pick, DHS. Mike, your final chance to weigh in with your overall winner. Give it to us. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty evident throughout. Uh, I like DHS's methodology. Um, and I think it results in currently a better makeup of companies. Um, that being said, there's a lot of overlap in these. I was just looking at the overlap analyzer and, you know, all three of these have 40% plus overlap across each other with SPYD and SPHD over 60. Um, so you're going to have super high correlation and super high um, small divergence of return. Um, I would, you know, I'm just going to take a little time back here. I, I think you have to think about dividends beyond just paying back um, um, cash. I think if you look at kind of the earnings consistency of true dividend payers, um, over time, that's a quality metric, and I think you'll find that they have a quality. Now, that's that's a big difference between reaching for the highest yielder um, and looking for true dividend-paying companies that aren't just yielding 12% because they can't sustain it. Um, and I, I think, you know, just to take a little shot at, at the, the buybacks, I love buybacks. I think, I think buybacks, dividends, all of them are a good sign of value. Um, but, you know, a lot of companies also tend to issue debt for buybacks, and I think – it's the quality of the buyback, just like the quality of the dividend. So we can poke holes in all strategies. I think by and large, um, thinking about um, a way to get value in a portfolio, to way to get income, um, you know, albeit you can always just sell your stock to get income just as easily. Um, I do think that um, dividend ETFs have a proven history of providing solid market returns. Um, granted, they are a value tilt, so the last decade has been rough, um, but fast forward 10 years, I think we'll probably have a different a different story to tell. DHS Excellent. is my winner though, Ron. <laughs> Perfect. Well, our judges have spoken and according to my battle scorecard, DHS is the winner. And our judges made some awesome points. Of course, Meb with his caveat, focus on shareholder yield, also liking value stocks. And then, of course, Mike uh, pointing out the fact that you got to look at the underlying industry sectors. Certainly, that's been driving a lot of the wonderful performance that we're seeing in um, DHS, which has really been on fire. So that's another thing that you definitely have to keep in mind. And uh, trust me, this will not be the last high dividend ETF battle that we do on this program. I think we already have some future rematches in the pipeline. Well, thanks again to you, Meb and Mike, for your Awesome analysis. Well done. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Ron. Be sure to visit the description section below for research links to our judges. Also, while you're there, check out the link to our program sponsor, Direction Investments, along with viewer resources. We've got online classes and other financial tools. Which ETF battle would you like to see in the next episode? Give us your ticker symbols in the comment section below or on our Twitter feed, at ETF Guide. I'm Ron Deleggi. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.